Welcome back to the Brain Hack Track. Wow, it's uh, be careful. Keep your hands around your ears so nobody can hack your brain during that time. And uh, now I have the pleasure to present here our next speaker who uses methods from neuroscience to understand the underlying mechanisms of our psychology. He works with patients undergoing brain surgery to study behavior, emotions, decision-making and dreams by directly recording the activity of individual nerve cells using electrodes implanting in their brain. The brain hacker, professor of neuroscience and business, Mr. Moran Sarf. Moran, welcome on stage. Okay, I'm hacking your presentation now. Okay. You've been hacked. All right, just a few words because he's very modest. Yesterday, this gentleman has been selected, elected, honored among the top 40 professors of the world under 40. Congratulations. <laughs> amazing. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now I'm totally thrown off. Um, so I am a neuroscientist, and I want to spend the next 15 minutes talking to you about the brain, but in the context of business. And now, some of you might ask yourself, what does neuroscience have to do with business, so why am I a neuroscientist speaking in an entrepreneurship and technology conference? So I'm going to convince you that all of you will have neuroscience in your work in the next 10 years, and I'm going to convince you, hopefully, also, that it's necessary to understand the brain in order to do the work in the years to come. So I'm not the first one to do that. In the last couple of years, there's more and more business schools who actually hire neuroscientists as part of their faculty to really help understand and shape the way we teach our students about uh, decision-making, about risk assessment, about marketing. And I was involved in this field for the next, last couple of years in trying to really help MBAs, CEOs, chief marketing officers understand how they can change the way they perceive people's thoughts and decisions by looking inside the vault rather than asking them. And the reason is that there was a problem in the last couple of years. And the problem is that more and more marketing managers, finance managers, CEOs, started seeing that when they ask people questions and try to understand from what they say, something about their future behavior, they aren't able to predict well what's going to happen. And that's because people lie. Now, they lie not because they're malicious, because they're malevolent. They lie because they don't know or because they don't want to tell you. And what I mean by that is that if we ask people questions in the way we asked them before, using surveys, using focus group, we usually get some intuitions that they have about reality, but not the full answer. And I like to give my students the example of uh, two industries that I looked at that showed us how big the gap is between what people actually say and what actually is happening in their brain. And those industries are the organic food industry and the pornography industry. Now, those are very, very different industries. But when you ask people questions about them, you get similar answers. And I'm going to tell you what we did in both industries. In the organic food industry, when I was living in Los Angeles, when I got my PhD, I lived in the small zip code 90036, where most of the Hollywood stars live. It's a kind of big neighborhood in West Hollywood. And there's a lot of supermarkets there and grocery stores there that sell really healthy and good food. And one day, one company had the idea to open an even healthier restaurant, an even healthier grocery store in the area that we all lived in. But it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So they came and they had a survey, and they asked everyone they could find in our zip code, if we open a supermarket in your neighborhood, it's going to be even healthier than the Whole Foods and the Trader Joe's that you already have, but it's going to be two or three times more expensive. How likely are you to actually buy something from this place? And in the survey, more than 90% of the people said they're definitely going to buy that. If it's healthier, we're going to buy it. So this company opened the supermarket. And after two years, they closed because no one came. Because in the end of the day, the people said, you know, I want to get a milk. And this place already sells me pretty healthy milk for $5. 
Should I go and spend $10, $12, $15 for a milk that's a little bit healthier? No, I'm not going to do that. People somehow, at the end of the day, even though they said in the survey, I will definitely do X, ended up doing Y. Now, it wasn't that they lied to us when we asked them. It's that they lied to themselves. And we all know it from ourselves. You all know that every year in January 1st, you promise to go to the gym this year every day. And every time you go to the store, you say, I'm going to buy jeans for the skinnier version of myself because I'm just going to lose this weight and I'm going to then get into these jeans. We all know that we lie to ourselves all the time because we believe we're going to be better in the future. Just think of alarm clocks. How often do you go to sleep and set the alarm to some time and then you press the snooze once? twice, three times, because the morning person isn't the same as the evening person. They're just two different people. Now, this is one type of lie that marketing managers have a hard time with, because we ask the question, we get the answer, and it doesn't predict what people are going to do. Also, there are lies that we just get because people don't want to tell us the answer. So when we had a survey in New York where we asked 1,000 people about their pornography viewing habits, turns out that out of 1,000 people, 999 don't ever watch pornography. Only one guy watches all the pornography. Now, if you know the bandwidth of the internet, there's a lot of bandwidth that's going there. So there's one guy who runs around and watches all the pornography in the world, because otherwise, we can't explain the results. And the reality is that people just didn't want to tell us the answer. So we were baffled. And we said, you know, how can we do some survey focus groups to people who don't want to give us the right answers? The answer is that not only are there problems with how people answer, there's also problems with how they think. We know that we have a lot of biases in our brain. In the last 10 years, neuroscientists and economists joined hands together to study how their brains perceive reality. And we learned, more than anything, that people have tons of biases that affect how they choose. They don't even know it. For example, you probably know that if you uh, put the price of an item as $6.99 rather than 7 people are going to sometimes perceive it as 6 rather than 7 because we're biased to look fast from left to right rather than right to left. That's not surprising to you. You all saw that. What's more surprising might be that people think actually in percentages rather than accurate numbers. So here's an example. Imagine that you live in a building, and right below your building, there's a store that sells watermelons. And let's say that under your building, the same watermelon costs $5. But if you walk two blocks away, there's a store that sells the same item for $1. So for two minutes, or let's say two blocks walk, you can save $4, or 20% can be 20% 20, 20 of the, the price. So the, it's 80% of the price. So you say, OK, you know what? I can go down and pay $5 here, or walk two blocks and pay $1. Hmm, definitely going to go there. Now I'm telling a different story. Imagine that under your building, there's a store that sells Tesla cars for $100,000. Two blocks away, they sell the same Tesla car for $99,996, $4 less. How likely to actually cross the street two blocks away to buy a Tesla car for $4 less? People say, come on, it's $4 out of 100000 Who cares? It's the same price. And that's because for our brain, we think in percentages. For economists, they think in numbers. For them, $4 out of a watermelon or $4 out of a Tesla is the same $4. But for us, they're very different. We also know that people have biases when it comes to things they don't know about prices. So if I'm going to buy wine, and I know nothing about wine, so I go into the shelf and there's a $5 wine, a $10 wine, and $20 wine, I'm more likely to buy the one in the middle just because I don't know. So I'm going to say I'm not going to buy the cheap one because I don't understand the prices. The most expensive one, the $20 one, seems too expensive for me, so I'm going to go for the middle one, which seems fair, $10. If the store wanted to sell me the $20 one, all they have to do is put a $50 next to it, and I'm going to say the same thing. Five seems too cheap, 50 way too expensive. I guess I'm going to buy the middle one, the $20 one. Now, this is a bias that people would never tell you they have. They don't know it. But somehow, when they come to make decisions, they are, they are following these routines, and they don't know what leads them to it. So what can we do? The reality is that we can actually look inside their brain and see how their brain processes information and learn what drives them, and then either make better choices, or if we're in the business side, help people understand the value of things by looking inside their brain and seeing what they value higher and give it to them. Now, in the last five years, neuroscientists finally understand something about how value is perceived in the brain, and they also understand that they can actually explain to business people, businessmen and women, how this data allows them to understand people's choices. Now, before I tell you a little bit of what we found in the last five years, let me make sure that I convince you that actually looking into the brain is the place to understand people's behavior. I'll do that by telling you a story uh, that Judging from the age group that I see inside, you probably don't remember, but you may have heard of. 
It's the story of a guy who got very famous in the 60s. Uh, his name is Charles Whitman. Charles Whitman became famous in grave circumstances when, in 1966, he took a cab from his house in Austin, Texas, and rode to the University of Austin, where he climbed a tall tower there, stood at the top, pulled an AK-47 and started spraying people down below. He killed 14 people, then he waited for the ambulance to show up, and then he shot them as well, and he kept spraying people from above, reloading the rifle again and again for about one hour, until eventually the police climbed the building and killed him. And after they did that, they tried to see what could have led a man to do something so awful. So they went to his neighborhood and they investigated, and what they saw is that it turns out that he was a great guy. He was a great neighbor, he was a great friend, he was discharged honorably from the Marines the year before. Everything seemed great about this guy. Why would he do something like that? When they went to his apartment, they found a little diary that he kept. And in his diary, he actually wrote that he feels that his brain is not okay. He said, I'm changing, I have awful thoughts, I'm afraid I'm going to do something bad any day now, please help me. And actually, the night before this killing, he wrote in his diary that he is afraid he's going to do something awful the day after because his brain makes him do those things and he doesn't know how to stop it. So he even writes in his diary that if I end up being dead tomorrow, I want the police to conduct an autopsy on my brain and see what's going on with it, and he even leaves a check for $30,000 for the police to do this autopsy. So they run this thing and they look at his brain and what they see that in his brain, he has a massive tumor pressing on the part of the brain that's called the amygdala that's right at the center that has to do with aggression and fear and anger and may have led to this behavior. Now, you don't have to go as far as cases of people who really changed entirely despite their desire to be the same. You can think of yourself last night. You all went to the carousel club. You had a little bit of a beer or wine and you poured some ethanol on your mucosal glands, and within half an hour, everything looks a little bit different. Everyone is a little nicer to you. Your jokes are much funnier. We all know this thing where we do a little bit of things to our brain, and our behavior changes entirely. So we all experience this thing. So if that's the case, can we predict people's behavior, maybe change it by looking inside their brain? The answer is yes, and the answer is that in the last five years, we actually know a little bit of how to do that. So I'm going to give you two examples, and I'm going to leave you with a message on what to do next to know about, more, but know about that more for yourself. So here's an example. A few years ago, a colleague of mine from Stanford wanted to see how their brain works in times of stress, and can we use it to help CEOs or athletes actually perform better? So he took a group of people that really have a unique moment when their brain is not working the same way and tried to see how they work in this environment. And here's what he did. He took people who were on a diet. And he said, all of you want to lose weight? Come to the lab and we're going to give you advice on how to lose weight by a nutritionist. So people come to the lab. They go to the lobby and he tells them, OK, here's how it's going to go. First, you're going to go to this room. You're going to get a number, a number. Come back here and you're going to wait a few minutes. And then you're going to go to the other room where you're going to be a nutritionist who's going to ask you what your number is and is going to give you advice about how to lose weight. So people come and they go to the other room and they get the number. And here's the thing. In this room, people actually get one of two types of numbers. Some people get a very short, only three digits number, one, two, three. And the others get a very long, 10 digits complex number, 3104009411. They both come back and they told, no, wait, remember the number, we're going to go back to the other room and someone's going to ask you what number it is and give you advice. And the experiment starts now. Because in the room that they're waiting, Baba, the guy who runs the study, leaves a nice, tasty, looky, creamy cake. And what he measures is how often do people actually take a nibble from the cake while they wait. Turns out, people who only have to remember three digits have no problem. Their, their mind is really kind of uh, easily uh, uh, remembering the numbers, so they have no problem also sustaining the desire to eat the cake, so they just don't eat anything. The people who have to remember 10 digits are so occupied by memorizing, say, 3104009411, 3104009411, all they have to do is use all of this muscle called the brain to remember this number. They have no more muscle to self-control, and they start eating out of the cake, even though they came to diet. So what happens there is that this is a demonstration of one thing that we know now, which is that the brain operates like a muscle, and self-control is in our brain. And accordingly, we can actually take each and every one of you and see how your brain works and see what is your capacity, how many digits you have to remember before you start doing things that you don't want to do. 
What time of the day is the best or worst time for you to make decisions? If you're a CEO, maybe you make decisions better in the morning, maybe you make decisions better in the evening. Maybe you make decisions better when you're hungry, maybe when you're full. Maybe after you listen to a lot of people, maybe when you're by yourself in a square tomb. Maybe just before the deadline, maybe many days before. For each and every brain in the room, there's a profile. And now, neuroscientists can actually look at you and help you understand how you yourself are at your best place. We work with athletes, we work with CEOs to study their brain and see what moments are the best moments for them to decide. What's more important is that we now also know how to change things if we tell you something that you don't want. If we tell you, you know, you make choices better when you're very nervous and very angry, and you say, I don't want to do that, I want to actually do things differently. Or if you say, you know, I, I, I really uh, want to wake up in the morning at 6 a.m., but I just can't do it because my brain really has a hard time making the choice that's right for me or actually relieve, leaving the choice it's made. We can now actually help you change your brain. And in the last two years, we actually learned that there are moments in your life where your brain is more likely to adapt and to change. For example, one time of the day when you're very restful and your brain is not resisting is the time that you're sleeping. So in the course of a seven hour sleep, we now know that there are windows, small moments, where your brain is actually thinking about the day it experienced and changing things and shaping things and moving memories from working memory to long-term memory. And if we come in this moment and intervene, we can actually make your brain take this information and change it rather than save it the way it is. So now, neuroscientists can actually take you while you sleep, figure out from looking at your brain exactly the moment in your night when memories are being moved from one place to another and intervene by spraying the right smell, playing the right sound, doing something that's going to help your brain remember one thing that it forgot and put it higher in the stack so it would actually be moved. And in the last two years, we know how to change behavior. We did some studies that showed that we can actually take smokers who are addicted to smoking and cannot stop any way they want, but in the night, by spraying the smell of cigarettes and a bad smell, we actually reframe the wiring in their brain about thinking about smoking to the point that they wake up in the morning, have no idea what happened, but suddenly, think differently about the same thing that they tried to stop for many, many years. Now, the reality is that you can see how this could be used for bad and good. Changing behavior in your sleep, affecting you when you don't know, all of those things have a really kind of a, a obscure way of either scaring us or being great, and it's up to us now to decide how to respond to that. But here's the reality. I give you two examples. We have an ample amount of examples that show that neuroscientists now know something about their brain that can help us make decisions better, change behavior, and understand something about ourselves that is different than what we understood before. They can tell you what you actually want, and they can help you understand how to change what you don't want to want. The first step in those changes is to understand that there is a problem. The second step is to start getting information. Now, up to now, there's a big gap between businessmen, businesswomen, and neuroscientists or other behavioral researchers. They aren't really speaking in the same conferences. And what I advocate is for you to just go to your nearby university, to your uh, colleague that does these works, and try to understand what it is. And you did the first step. You came here, and you gave me 15 minutes to talk to you about what, what's possible. And hopefully, I convinced you that there's room for you to use that in your business. The next step is to do one more effort, and that is not that to change behavior that you don't want, but change the way you think about how to study consumers and how to understand what they want by going outside of the spectrum that you always lived in and ask people that are outside to give you some of the knowledge that we acquired in the last five years about how the brain can influence our behavior and how this behavior can help you make different choices in your businesses. Thank you so much.